The Night Beat starts right now. A collision of viruses. You might have heard about flu Rona by now. So what is it and could we see it in Bear County? Well, lo local doctors have to say coming up. And the spread of COVID-19 impacting a major theater in San Antonio. And we also know this virus stretches beyond county lines. So what are some of our surrounding counties experiencing? That story coming up in a moment. But first, an Amber Alert called off, but the search continuing tonight. As you will see, it is not the first time something like this has happened, but it did lead San Antonio to police to make one thing clear. The search for little Lena Keel continues. Sources telling us the alert was called off for procedural reasons. Today is day 19 in this case. The three year old girl was last seen at a playground at her apartment complex on Fredericksburg Road. A $150,000 reward still being offered and police are still processing tips. Now back in 2019, an Amber Alert was discontinued for Eva Garcia while the search for her was still underway. Police in Hondo at the time told us the alert was discontinued after a lull in receiving tips. She was found months later in San Antonio and police reunited her with family. And news of the disappearance of three year old Lena Keel enough to rattle any parent or caregiver for that matter. Police have so far said they don't have any leads to indicate that Lena was abducted. But as this investigation continues, child safety advocates say that parents should take time to talk to kids about potential dangers and empower them to speak up if they feel unsafe. The night team's Patty Santos tells us when those conversations should actually begin. But if a parent is having the feeling that they want to start to have conversations with their kids, then that is the most appropriate time. Randy McGibbon with Child Safe says the time to talk to your kids about their safety is now. Because the last thing you want to do is have any regret about not having said conversation. Talk to your kid at their level of understanding, whether they're three or 13. Having conversations with children about appropriate boundaries to protect their bodies at the earliest possible age is the most appropriate thing that we can do to help our children to ensure and guard against things like abduction, things like sexual abuse and physical abuse. McGibney reminds us stranger abductions are extremely rare. The majority of the cases that we're actually seeing here are not perpetrated against children by strangers. They're perpetrated against children by people that the child actually knew. He suggests parents have candid and repeated conversations with kids and be ready to answer their questions. And doing so at an early age empowers them to speak up. If you don't know how to start, ask other parents or your pediatrician. Children oftentimes, you know, do have that trust your gut sense. Pediatrician Mandy Svitek says try role playing scenarios and offer them a plan if they find themselves in trouble. And then identifying really somebody perhaps a neighbor or a police officer um, that they can really, you know, turn to should should there be an immediate need. Safely Ever After Inc., a safety education website suggests you teach kids their name and a parent's phone number, teach them to stay away from tricky people and teach them not to go anywhere without permission. And then being upfront, letting them know what's going on in the community, what has recently happened. Emma Givney says use words that your child can understand, but use the appropriate word for the body part that you're trying to explain and make sure that your child feels safe and supported at the end of that conversation. We have many more scenarios and more resources you can use on KSAT.com. Steve, Myra. Important conversations to have. Thank you, Patty. But 160 lives. That's how many were lost to homicide in San Antonio in 2021. The San Antonio Police Department reporting it is the highest homicide count since 1994. According to police records obtained and analyzed by KSAT, the tally is higher than the most recent spike in 2016 when 151 killings were reported. Despite the numbers, police still believe San Antonio remains a safe place to live, saying if you're not engaging in risky criminal behaviors, your chance of becoming a victim of violence are very low, with the exception of family violence. The coronavirus making its way to one of San Antonio's famous performance venues, the Majestic Theater confirming an outbreak of COVID among vaccinated cast members of Hamilton. So now they're postponing those shows. The Majestic tweeting tonight to let customers know 
telling them to hold on to their tickets as they work to reschedule those shows. Right now, only the weekend performances are being impacted. That's tonight's performance as well as on Saturday and Sunday. The theater says that all future performances of Hamilton beyond this weekend are scheduled to go on as planned for now. And for the second year in a row, the official Martin Luther King March in San Antonio will not be happening because of the pandemic. This is the largest MLK March in the entire country. The plan is to update last year's virtual pre-recorded parade to continue the celebration online this year. Otherwise, the actual in-person march has been canceled. Very, very tough. It's very sensitive. It breaks out of our hearts that we're still in this environment. But the MLK Commission is trying to do something about that. They are working with Metro Health to plan a pop-up vaccination clinic and testing site. That's at Pittman Sullivan Park on Martin Luther King Day. As for Dream Week, organizers say they will continue with virtual events and some in-person events with smaller gatherings. We've seen the daily cases go up. More people also being hospitalized after catching COVID-19. Here in Bear County, the number of patients now rising to 679 in area hospitals, 150 in intensive care units, 59 patients on ventilators. Metro Health also reporting one new death today, along with 4,331 new cases. If I'm not mistaken, that's almost double what we saw yesterday. Mm. The Omicron variant isn't just spreading in Bear County, though. Several surrounding counties also dealing with signatures of this virus. The night team's John Paul Barajas checked in to see what's happening in Comal, Kendall, and Uvalde counties. Rural counties are being hit hard by the Omicron variant. Cases are booming in Kamau County. They saw their largest daily COVID case count since the pandemic started yesterday with 315 cases. Today, they added another 236, along with one new death and 39 people in the hospital. A county spokesperson did not return our calls and emails, but on their social media page, they are sharing CDC guidance. Responses online show some urge people to stay home if they're sick, one person suggested the opposite, something doctors don't recommend. Over in Uvalde County, their health authority, Dr. Jared Reading, calling their cases out of control. They added 60 today and have seen 395 new cases in the last seven days. But there is a sole bright spot. Luckily, Omicron is not quite the same variant as Delta or the original strain. Um, what I'm trying to say is about, they estimated about 20% of all cases needed a, needed a hospital with the first strain with Delta. With Omicron, we're looking about maybe 1% to 2%. Within San Antonio city limits, these types of spikes are canceling events, but in Uvalde and Kendall, things are still going as planned. I mean, I think every community needs to do what they think is right for them. Bernie in this area, I think people are taking precautions, but they're being reasonable and still want to get on with their lives. So. You know, you got to balance everything. This Kendall County man not too worried despite COVID cases rising. Another 30 cases were added there today. A Bernie spokesperson tells us they're seeing an uptick in cases and quarantines among city employees, but so far it's not impacting city services and first responders' response times. Still, the increase has some students concerned. We might have to go back to online school. Just the social aspect about it, because all your friends, you know, that you're finally able to see after the lockdown for two years, um, it all just falls apart. And during the last surge, Texas saw about 13,000 people hospitalized. Currently, we have 9,000, about 9,000 people hospitalized, and that number is expected to go up. Health officials say the majority of those people are those who are not vaccinated and that the best way to protect yourself is to get the vaccine and get a booster shot. John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, John Paul. Let's talk about testing sites now. There are actually three more COVID-19 testing sites that will be opening up next week. The first one opens Tuesday at the Yates Community Center on Rasa Drive. Then on Wednesday, a testing site will open at the Melendres Community Center on West Commerce Street. Thursday, the Copernicus Community Center on Lord Road will be up and running. We're keeping a running list of these testing sites, their hours. What you need to know before you go to get tested right now, you can find all that at ksat.com. And if you still need to get a COVID-19 vaccine, we have a list for that as well. Just use your phone to scan the QR code right there in the corner of your screen, left hand side. Doctors continue to encourage people to get the shots and the boosters to better protect yourself from severe symptoms 
and hospitalization. A reminder that Pfizer's booster shot is now approved for children as young as 12. Metro Health's pop-up clinics and the Alamo Dome vaccine site plan to start offering boosters to kids between 12 and 15 on Wednesday. Cool and damp to start the weekend. Already drizzly outside, areas of fog, reduced visibility. 40 degrees right now officially in San Antonio at the airport. Visibility under a mile now. And get ready for some pretty thick fog through the night and the first part of your Saturday. You'll take a look at the visibilities. Kerrville, Fredericksburg, three quarters of a mile. Rock Springs, only a quarter of a mile. Clearly, the fog has settled in and it's moved in pretty quickly. Bernie. Right now, visibility of half a mile. So anticipate the thick fog to start the day. Even a few little sprinkles out there right now. Not much being detected by radar. Most of it is drizzle, but some of these little light showers will be passing through south and central Texas through the night in the first part of the day tomorrow. So a damp start here Saturday, about 37, 38 degrees in the morning for most of us. And then we will see some changes into Sunday ahead of our next cold front. We'll talk more about the rest of the weekend in a bit. Thank you, Adam. Still ahead on the night beat, Fluorona. What is it? Why doctors say it's more of a possibility this year than last. And a new study involving children, the coronavirus, and diabetes. What the CDC says it has learned so far. And plus, another city council member calling for someone to look into CPS Energy. We're less than a week away from a vote on potential increase on your electric bill. So where do city council members stand right now? It's next on the night beat. The vote on a rate hike on your electric bill less than a week away. More San Antonio council members calling for transparency if they agree to that rate increase. District 6 Councilwoman Melissa Cabello Haverda actually sent a formal request to CPS Energy requesting an audit. She wants a third party to look into the utilities finances and management practices. She's one of several council members leaning towards voting yes. Councilman Mario Bravo also on that same side, but has also requested an outside study. The rate proposal needs six votes to pass. Only five told us that they are at least leaning that way so far. As you can see, there's a lot undecided, though. That vote is scheduled for Thursday. Other big stories tonight, life in prison. That is the future for Greg and Travis McMichael, two of three men convicted in the killing of 25-year-old Ahmad Arbery. Today, a Georgia judge said there was no chance of parole for the father and son. Meanwhile, the third man involved, William Roddy Bryan, will have to serve at least 30 years in prison before parole can be considered for him. The three are convicted of murder, aggravated assault, false imprisonment, and attempted false imprisonment. COVID-19 and diabetes in children. And a new study actually from the CDC suggests a possible link and increased risk for the disease. More than half a million COVID-19 patients under the age of 18 were studied. Researchers say children who had COVID-19 more likely to be diagnosed with diabetes less than a month later. COVID plus winter weather forcing more flights to stay grounded. There were more than 2,000 flight cancellations today, according to FlightAware. And a winter storm that first struck parts of Kentucky and Virginia shifted to the northeast. New York City seeing its first significant snow of the season. At least five inches blanketing the city and parts of New England. A flu rona. It's the collision between flu season and the coronavirus, and some doctors even calling it a potential double whammy this year. Dr. Brian Alsup with University Health telling us we avoided fluorona last year because most people took proper precautions. Last flu season was we really didn't see a whole lot of laboratory confirmed flu, and I think a majority of that had to do with uh, the human behaviors that people were exhibiting. Uh, uh, diligent mask wear and distancing were probably a lot more prevalent a year ago than they were uh, this time of year. The doctor says San Antonio already seeing a higher number of flu cases. And while it's unclear whether having the flu can make COVID-19 more severe, doctors say your body would essentially be fighting off two viruses at the same time. Experts say wearing a mask, getting your flu and coronavirus vaccine can, of course, help. Live cam tonight. Look outside. 40 degrees and misty. Kind of, just kinda, is that fog or what is that out there? It's fog and drizzle and a few sprinkles coming and going. But Ooh. yeah, it's fog and drizzle settling in. 
So just the nuisance moisture out there right now, not the good, really beneficial type of rainfall. So earlier today we started off at the freezing point then we made it up to only 44. Those low clouds, they came in fast and they kept us cool. And then they, they're acting like a blanket tonight. So temperatures aren't going to fall off a lot from where they are right now. But we only made it into the 40s to near 50 across most of our area today because of the clouds. The exception, Del Rio, 63 for the high. But we will be warming up a bit and gradually into the weekend. Take a look across the state. You can tell where we had sun west of I-35. That's where temperatures were a bit warmer in the 50s, 60s, and even El Paso, 70 degrees. But underneath the clouds, we were stuck in the 40s. And right now, it's for the most part, right around 40 degrees. Obviously, a few exceptions out there. Laredo 45, Kerrville 41, 43 Pleasanton, 42 now in Uvalde, and 40 in San Antonio. But I do anticipate anywhere from about 37 to 42 degrees by tomorrow morning. That's what we're expecting for the low temperatures. So a chill in the air, but luckily with this moisture, will be above freezing. So damp and cool to start your Saturday. Hello to us about 39 Converse at 38. Then by the afternoon, we make it to near 60 degrees, but I think some locations, especially north of downtown, will be in the upper 50s. Bernie, Timberwood Park, Leon Springs, probably about 59 for your high temperatures. By Sunday, we're back in the low 70s. Then our next cold front hits Sunday afternoon. That'll drop us back into the upper 50s by Monday. So a little bit of a roller coaster and yo-yo effect here in terms of temperatures. And then we gradually warm up into next week. But close to average is what we're looking at for most of next week. So a brief warm up on Sunday, low 70s, and then close to average. So take a look at the radar. The drizzle is not detectable by the radar. Keep that in mind. We have drizzle <laughs> across most of our area here, but what we can detect are these little light showers, a bright green color on the radar moving south to north. These will continue to come and go for the rest of the night and even about the first half of the day tomorrow. The main energy in the atmosphere and the jet stream is off to the north of us. That's the main storm track for us. All we have is this nuisance moisture that doesn't add up to a whole lot. Sure, it's better than nothing, but we're not looking at any good, beneficial or appreciable rain. One exception is east of I-35 where a few thunderstorms could develop through tomorrow morning and midday. That's where you could have just a few quick, heavier showers. Otherwise, as our future cast alludes to as well, just some light sprinkles and light showers, a few hundredths of an inch here and there. And if we're lucky, we could see closer to a tenth of an inch or more closer to Howitzville, Cuero, Gonzales and Victoria. The low clouds also linger throughout the day tomorrow. So we start in the upper 30s near 40, damp and kind of sprinkly out there. And then by the afternoon, the clouds will lift a little bit. It won't be as damp, but still fairly gray. So near 60 and a south wind at 5 to 10. Sunday, back to some sunshine after a brief morning fog. Low 70s becoming breezy because of a cold front Sunday afternoon. Not a very strong front. We should stay above freezing behind that front. Okay, thanks, Adam. All right, so before the Cowboys roll into town, the Spurs were in Philly. A good illustration of what's to come, perhaps, I hope, not for the Cowboys yeah. because it was a train wreck for the Spurs. Now, and you had to wonder how they were going to be able to handle the um, the 76ers being so shorthanded, but they did make Spurs history tonight. We'll explain coming back. Plus, a local legend retires coming up. Spurs down six players tonight in Philadelphia due to COVID protocol. So Josh Primo gets a start setting the franchise record for the youngest Spur to start a game, 19 years old in two weeks. So it's only fitting as he knocks down the Spurs' first bucket of the game. A little later, he gets the corner three to fall, but the Spurs are down double digits early thanks in part to Seth Curry's 13 first quarter points. Sixers lead by 20 after one. Spurs start to show a little life in the second. DeJounte Murray from the elbow gets a friendly bounce to fall. Then Bryn Forbes with a nice dish to Jakob Pertl under the basket. And the Spurs are on a 10-0 run. And the lead is trimmed to nine. Spurs outscored the Sixers by two in the second. But Philly had their best shooting half of the season at 67%. And they lead 18 at the half. Murray putting the Spurs on his back tonight. First three from the right side. Then check out the driving baseliner under the hoop for the layup. And then straightaway three in transition. He scored eight straight points for the Spurs. But the Sixers were up 17 after three. Spurs open the fourth on a 9-2 run. This hurled dunk cuts the Sixers lead down to 12. Murray comes up with a steal. The dunk on the other end. He led the silver and black with 27 tonight, but it wasn't enough as the Sixers roll the Spurs 119 to 100. Next up for the Spurs, they'll stay out on the East Coast. They take on the Brooklyn Nets early on Sunday, 11 a.m.
Pro Football Coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. When the Dallas Cowboys arrived in Philadelphia tonight for the regular season finale against the Eagles, they left a number of players behind, among them Trayvon Diggs, who's been sidelined with an illness all week long, unable to practice with the Cowboys Pro Bowl. Cornerback was never placed on the COVID reserve list. That means his quest to break the regular season record of 11 interceptions after he tied Everson Walls will end that way. Joining Diggs back in Dallas are Donovan Wilson, who has also been ill but has not been officially ruled out for the game. Safety J. Ron Curse and running back Tony Potter also not on the team charter today due to injuries. Curse has been limited all week due to a bad hamstring. Tony Potter is still struggling with that nagging foot injury. Earlier in the week, star rookie Micah Parsons was ruled out after he tested positive for COVID-19 along with left tackle Tyron Smith and cornerback Antonio Brown. So how will defensive coordinator Dan Quinn handle the shortage on defense starting with Parsons? I think what we've learned uh, certainly in 2021, um, you know, we've had a lot of people in and out of the lineup, and uh, every week it was seemingly something. And so I think that's been the way of the 2021 season. I think more than anything, you adjust and you attack. And uh, I do love that about our defense. Um, you never know who's going to get a chance or a moment to step up, um, but I do know that they'll be ready to roll. And I think um, this season we've definitely lived it as coaches and players. And so the numbers and the names change some. Uh, but the one thing that can't change is is what we do and who we are. And uh, I think that's that's true in football and that's true in life, that you adjust and you attack. Don't forget, you can catch the Cowboys and the Eagles live on KSAT 12 tomorrow night at 7.15. In the first major step before training camps open in March, the USFL announced the hiring of four coaches, two of which are very recognizable here in San Antonio. Mike Riley, who is a former coach of the San Antonio Commanders of the ill-fated AAF, has been named the new coach of the New Jersey Generals. And former Aggies head coach Kevin Sumlin is returning to Houston to coach the Gamblers. Player selections begin next month. Training camps open in March. The original USFL that included the San Antonio Gunslingers kicked off in 1983, but ended three years later when owners started signing players to personal services contracts. A coaching legend retiring next. Former Longhorn quarterback Casey Thompson is transferring to Nebraska. Thompson making an announcement today on Twitter for visiting the Cornhusker campus early this week. He led the Longhorns with 2,119 yards passing with 24 touchdowns and nine interceptions starting the final 10 games after he backed up Sam Ellinger and appeared to be his heir apparent when he threw for four touchdowns in the Valero Alamo Bowl in December a year ago, beating Colorado 55-23. to Now he replaces Adrian Martinez in Nebraska after Martinez decided to transfer to Kansas State. Congratulations, St. Mary's baseball coach and former athletic director Charlie Meagle, who is hanging up his cleats today after 40 years on the Rattler campus. Meagle was actually a four-year letterman at St. Mary's, where he earned his bachelor's degree before beginning his career as a coach for St. Mary's in 1982, an assistant baseball coach before he was named Head coach five seasons later, in his 35 years as head baseball coach, Charlie posted 33 winning seasons, amassing 1,246 wins, which is fifth in the nation among all active NCAA coaches. Meagle guided the Rattlers to the Division II National Championship in 2001 to go along with his 15 conference titles, seven NCAA regionals, and three trips to the NAIA World Series. During that time, he also served as athletic director from 2001 through 2013 before calling it a career today. Well, I think the biggest thing, you know, I've coached all these years, which is a lot of years, but the, the thing that just stands out in my mind the most is when we won the national championship and we won the last game. I've only won the last game one time, and that's a special, that's a special time. And those guys, you know, you never forget that, and it's such a, it's such a neat deal. But then we had other teams that got close, and uh, I treasure all those guys. I think it's the greatest thing, and, and uh, uh, I love them all. You know, looking at Charlie, I, I just realized he is St. Mary's University, just like Buddy Meyer yeah. is St. Mary's and the late Jim Kett. And growing up next to St. Mary's University, I know how much that means to all the Rattlers. And what a beautiful baseball stadium they yeah, have it's there. it's just great out there. Yeah. They've done a very good job of upgrading. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Greg. We'll be right back.